Ms. Guamagat Beach Nourishment Proposal, Caswell Cook Jr., Executive Director, Ms. Guamagat Business Association. Take it away, Caswell. Well, if I could figure out how to do this PowerPoint. Good evening. Almost. They gave me written directions. Aha, there we go. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for uh, letting me come before the council. Um, I want to just sort of preface my remarks as saying that I am not a scientist. I am not a climate change expert. I am not a coastal geologist. Um, and I'm not even a politician anymore, which is good. Um, but I am a person who for 30 years has had a business in Musquamacut, and for 24 years I've run the Musquamacut Business Association. I don't currently live in Musquamacut, but I have lived in Musquamacut um, in terms of the, the fire district. And obviously you guys have seen the damage, the whole town has seen the damage that has incurred this winter especially um, as a result of just regular storms um, used to be that we say, oh, we had the big one in 38 and 54 and Hurricane Bob. And you can kind of say, well, every you know generation you get one of those storms that's destructive. But as you've seen and as you've all spent tons of money as the town this year, shoveling the streets after a rainstorm, um, it's at the point where there's kind of, it's kind of at a breaking point. And I and I know that there's never much of an appetite to spend money at the beach. I get it. Um, a lot of the folks there are second homeowners and, you know, Westerly has a love hate relationship with second homeowners. Um, it's just the way it's always been. And I, I think there's probably a way that I could explain or present something to you in a way that might appeal to you and to the general public in the town of Westerly. So that's kind of my attempt tonight. This is just a proposal. It doesn't come from the Musquamica Business Association. It kind of comes from me um, and I, I kind of want it to get some inertia on its own. So if the residents agree and the fire district agrees, so I, I'm taking this presentation on the road. I started at the Chamber of Commerce, going to the fire district uh, in a week or so. But, you know, having served in your seat there for, you know, eight terms for 16 years, I know that without the town's buy-in, uh, this, this would go nowhere. So. My proposal is for Musquamica Beach Nourishment, and I'm gonna explain a little bit about what nourishment is, uh, but first I wanna sort of uh, go over what the problem is, what the history is, who does this affect? I have a video so that all of this just doesn't come from me. I've, I've got a video with some experts that actually have uh, done projects in other places around the country. And then I do have a call for action, which I will basically place in your hands. We all know what the problems are at the beach, uh, sea level rise, climate change. Uh, part of Musquamacut is on a barrier beach and barrier beaches want to migrate. They want to move. If we knew in 1890 when Atlantic Beach Park was built, what we know today, none of that stuff would have gotten built. Um, and it would look like the dunes on the Cape. And that's probably the way it should have been. Um, but we didn't know that then, and people just kept building and building, and, and we have what we have today. And so now we have to deal with a, with a, with a problem. Um, and now we have this whole situation with frequent storms, and some of them aren't even storms. Some of them are just high tides uh, with a little bit of wind that are just causing havoc along our entire shore of our town. So we lose shoreline each year. I mean, you guys have all heard presentations from geologists. You know, we lose a foot of shoreline a year on good years. We lose a, a three feet of shoreline per year uh, on, on a bad year. And that's been going on since uh, URI started studying this back in the 1950s. And you've seen probably maps of how shorelines have eroded over the years. Um, and I explained before, barrier beaches want to move. Hurricanes and superstorms, they, they ravage the beach and the infrastructure. But now a regular nor'easter or just a wind and rain event causes hurricane-like damage and flooding. And that's why we're at kind of a critical breaking point. Um, this is a great picture. So if you look at the corner of that building, that's the, that's the patio of the windjammer. And look how high the sand was and how far out the beach went. Now keep your eye on the corner of that sort of cement structure with the white top. 
that's that cement structure right there. That's where it's at right now. It's literally at the ocean at this point. So all those years ago when we were like, people were studying what we could do, how we could do things. I went through some old files of the NBA from the 80s when Mario Celico was the president and he had like barrier reef project proposed. But of course, back then you had all that beach and you had time and now there's just no more time. It's, it's here and it's destroying things that are along the shore. Um, so what have we done to mitigate currently? Um, we did a dredge project, one of the councils that I was on, and it placed some of the sand from the Winnipeg pond onto the state beach. But unfortunately it proves ineffective because you have a three mile stretch of beach and it's, you know, all of a sudden it juts out 150 feet into the ocean. Well, what's going to happen? It's going to just get pushed away, which it did. I mean, it's, it, some of it's still there, but it just got sort of shoved down the beach and then, you know, gets a hundred, sits a hundred feet off the shore. You can't just do like little measures and say, we're only going to do something in front of the town beach or only going to do something in front of the Andrea because it, it it's, you have to take the whole thing into effect, into consideration. We raised a lot of structures after Superstorm Sandy and every structure that could get raised, including the town beach was raised. But if there's no more road to get down there, it doesn't matter if you raise your structures, if the water is underneath them, you're kind of up the creek. No proposals from anybody takes into account the whole stretch of beach. It's all kind of separate and piecemeal. The state does their portion. The fire district does their portion. The town fixes the town beach. And the residents try to band together and, and put some band-aids on their sections. And, and nothing takes this whole stretch into account. There's been a ton of studies done. Um, building coastal resiliency at Musquamica Beach. This. Uh, uh, Pawkatuck River uh, Integrated Feasibility Report. I mean, all these studies have been done and come to different conclusions. Um, but again, they're just studies and nobody has done any of the action part of those things. So we've got tons of years of studies of what's going on at the beach. And now it's time to maybe take some of that information and, and have action. This is a quick video. So now this video here, I think it was actually either the police chief or it was the town manager that took this video. This is at the far end of Atlantic Avenue. This was just one of those winter storms. And I'm gonna play the video and you'll see how the water, this is Atlantic Avenue right here, but you'll see how the water rushes down to all of the side streets. So this is just a regular storm and that, that road is impassable and the water is just rushing down into the neighborhoods. I mean, that's uncontrollable. And that's just from a, a high tide event. And, and that's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, so it's, it's real stuff. And then this is what you guys deal with all winter. I don't know how much money the town spent. Was it a hundred grand? Was it more, you know, putting public works in Musquamica for three months to clean up the streets. I mean, if, if that street was, you know, anywhere else in town, <laughs> You know, people maybe you don't notice it in the winter because there's not as many people that live on that on that street. But th this is major damage to the town's infrastructure, um, and that's what it looks like after every single storm. Um, so, who does this affect? Who you know? There's always been this thing where Westerly is kind of divided into these different segments: the people out in Bradford, those people down in Watch Hill. The people in Musquamica, you know, at the end of the day, this is all westerly and we all uh, are part of this town. So who does this affect? Well, it affects the residents. It affects the businesses. It affects public access. It affects westerly taxpayers. It affects local and state economy. It affects town and state property and it affects the fire district. So what would westerly lose if you and the state and the feds did nothing? That, that's probably the real you know, question. $9 million a year in property taxes. So think about the budget you guys just did. I don't even know what the budget is now. Is it 100 million yet? 100 million. Think about if you had to find, if you had to plug a $9 million hole because that strip was gone. That's huge. That's a huge portion of, of your budget. You'd lose a thousand seasonal jobs. Where would the kids work in the summer that go to the high school? Everybody works down the beach in the summer, right? I mean, some of your kids work for me, <laughs> Joy, you know? Um, and so you're gonna lose a thousand seasonal jobs. You're gonna lose 50 businesses, five zero. I drove up and down Atlantic Avenue and I don't know that anyone's aware, but there are 215 houses on that street. 
I'm going to say that number again, 215 houses on Atlantic Avenue. That's not including the side streets. You have a town beach pavilion there. You have property that you're now spending millions of dollars to purchase at the beach, which is a good thing. There's a state beach pavilion, which has 3,000 parking spaces. Where in the town of Westerly do you have 3,000 parking spaces? Nowhere. You have two trailer parks. You would lose millions of dollars in hotel and meals tax and the state beach parking revenue. Think about it. Musquamic at State Beach is the largest revenue generating state beach in the state of Rhode Island. The state loses, the town, you'll lose a few hundred thousand dollars per year if that state beach lot is washed out and nothing is done. It's a huge economic uh, benefit to the town to have the beach. So I wanted to kind of give you a little map and show you the areas I'm talking about. I mean, when you look at that, all those areas that are shaded in yellow are what is at risk if we lose that little strip of beach right there. All of those homes. So in addition to the 218 homes along Atlantic Avenue, there's a couple hundred more houses that are all going to be washed away like they were, you know, they were all flooded during Superstorm Sandy. And then the other end of the beach, same thing. You got all a breach drive. You can't get past Weekapog Road when there's a storm. And all of those houses on Atlantic Avenue, on both sides of Atlantic Avenue, they're all in jeopardy, all of them. And let's take it a little bit bigger. This is the town of Westerly. You can see the airport in the middle. We're not talking about like a few people or a few little businesses. We're talking about an entire segment, a three mile stretch of your town that is in jeopardy of falling into the ocean. And so it's a huge problem that affects residents, businesses, and more. So does anyone really care if the beach goes away? <laughs> well, that's a Saturday at the beach. Now, there's probably 10,000 people on that beach on a Saturday. And each one of them, there's some kind of formula that probably the Chamber of Commerce could tell you how much each person spends when they come to town, whether it's 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, it's probably at least 100 with what you have to pay for lunch and stuff like that. We lose that and Westerly becomes Hopkinton in terms of property taxes. If we don't have all this additional income, these additional jobs, this additional business, as a town, we're screwed. And, and Meskwamek, it's the only place you got true public access to the beach. You don't in Weekapog. You're fighting over one street and 12 parking spaces. You don't necessarily have as much in Watch Hill. I mean, there's parking and stuff, but it's just, you know, it's not the same. To get out to Napa Tree Point is a pain because where do you park? You don't have that problem in Meskwamekit. Now picture Meskwamekit Beach, all the structures being gone from the Weekapog Bridge down to Paddy's and it becomes this open stretch of plain beach. Some people say, aha, that's what we want. But then where would you park to access it? You could look at it, but all those houses up and down the side roads, there's no parking lot. So how would people access this stretch of beach that has nothing on it, theoretically? They wouldn't, because you don't go walking out on those big spits out on Cape Cod. You just look at it from the shore and say, well, that's kind of cute out there, you know, that barrier beach. But you gotta you gotta hike it to get there. And there's never anybody on it because who's got the time to go out there and do that? It's like Nap Tree Point. You really have to work hard to get out there. The thing about Musquamakit is that's easy access for people to go to the beach. And I know people scream and yell, it's $30 to get a state beach pass. Come on, man, that's cheap. You can't get anywhere for $30 in this day and age. And so to have access, it, it's a huge thing. So what are the solutions? I, I don't have all the solutions, but I think I have what could be the best solution for the town. And I'm gonna give you a quick overview. I'm gonna have someone else explain it with a video in a second. And then I'll, I'll tell you what it'll cost because that's what everyone wants to know. So NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has done 400 projects across America that have placed 1.5 billion cubic yards of sand along the continental US coastline. And you can go to the database, it's in my PowerPoint, um, it's beach nourishment, it's at the end of the NOAA website. It's got the projects, the newest projects, the oldest projects, the known length, the total cost, the total volume, it's all there. And projects are being done in Long Island, the Outer Banks, Virginia, Florida, Alabama, all over the place. I've seen it done in Galveston, Texas, and I've watched these projects. So this is a video, and now the man behind the curtain is gonna have to actually play the video so you can hear the audio. But before we play the video, there's three things on this video. One of them is um, a city planner 
from Virginia Beach. So the actual city has decided to do beach nourishment and it shows how their project is done. Number two is a uh, another project that I, I forget where it is, but it shows what offshore dredging does. And the third is what was just done on Montauk, uh, which I'll speak about on Long Island, which is only 40 miles away. So if we can roll the video and have the audio. The topic of the day, feeding the beaches. Every few years, the city and or the Army Corps of Engineers replenishes the sands along our shorelines. The replenishment work will widen the shoreline to 300 feet and raise the beach to nine feet above sea level. When it is complete, the resort beach will have 1.4 million cubic yards of sand added to it. The primary function of a wide beach is to protect oceanfront infrastructure from a hurricane. The more space we can create between the ocean and the buildings and roadways, the more likely we are to withstand storm flooding. Crews are working in 1,000 foot sections from 15th Street headed north to 70th Street. Each section takes about two to three days to complete with work taking place 24 seven. The work is temporary and will ensure our beach is around for years to come and our infrastructure is protected. Now, this is Montauk and this was just, you can keep running the video, I'll talk over it. So when I look at this video, this was just done in January. Uh, Long Island is going to be doing 83 miles of shoreline, but they started excuse, in Montauk. Excuse me, Caswell. Point of order. I, the time ran out. I think we need to take a vote to extend your your time. We can't. Um, how much? About how much more time? You five more minutes. Five minutes. If there's no objection, we'll go another five minutes. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, so if you want to keep playing the video, so. This to me looks just like Atlantic Avenue. I mean, think about it. That looks like Atlantic Ave. That looks like Winnipeg Pond. And the light colored sand is how much sand we currently have now. And all that extra sand is what they put on the beach. Um, and this is a project that literally is taking place 40 miles off our coast. So it's not like uh, a beach replenishment project is something that's uh, you know, strange or it's not proven or it's it's crazy. I mean, this is what they're doing. And this is the kind of thing that's needed if we want to keep Musquamica Beach um, intact, because as the lady said, you've got to put more distance between in Ocean View. The beach renourishment project continues to fill the sand here in the Willoughby spit area. Today we got an inside look into how the sand gets from the bay and onto the shoreline, as well as how well this replenishment project has held up against the recent round of storms. We sailed out to the middle of the Chesapeake Bay and right by the HRBT, we found the Great Lakes Dredging Company's dredge ship, Liberty Island, waiting to start the workday. At the helm, Captain James Hoffman. You'll see the guys pick it up with a grappling hook. Earlier in the day, the Liberty Island combed the bay floor and it used two gigantic pumps like this one to vacuum up sand. This goes down into the sea bottom and probably goes into the seabed about that. And it's like a cheese grater. It just picks it right up. You can see the dry sand in the hopper right here. A lot of times it'll load all the way from the back of the hopper forward. Hoffman says roughly 480 dump truck loads of sand sit in the bottom of the ship. And then the Liberty Island sails over to hook up to this pipeline. The pipeline stretches two miles to the shoreline. The ship's pump engine spring to life with a deafening roar and the sand slowly drops through the pipeline. And it shoves it down into the pipe, goes through the pumps that you just saw and sends it ashore. You see the end product, tons of sand spread out by bulldozers and front end loaders. Project manager Robert Pretlow says at 80% complete, the new beach has held up well against recent storms. From what they're finding so far, it has been no major um, impact on what was placed. With close to three football stadiums worth of sand dumped, it's easy to see it's a massive project. In the era of erosion, scenes like this may repeat across not only Norfolk, but all of Hampton Roads shorelines. As this project gets closer to finishing, a fair amount of this Great Lakes dredging company equipment will be heading south to the Outer Banks, where they will be taking care of the Four Town Beach Renourishment Project in Duck, Southern Shores, Kitty Hawk, as well as Kill Devil Hills. In Norfolk, I'm Matt Gregory. Tell on your side. All right, so now I got to take control of this uh, thing back here. Uh, let's see, share screen. Uh, 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 I guess I go back to that. Yep, and then I think I can. Might need some technical help here. Oh, 
I got it. All right, let me just go to where I was so that we can. The topic of the day. All right, cool. All right, let me let me finish up. I know you've got other things on the agenda, but so these projects are designed to manage the risk of uh, coastal storm damage uh, in a way that balances risk to human life and property while maintaining, enhancing, and restoring the ecosystem integrity and coastal biodiversity. And this is kind of how it works. Uh, it's this vacuum-like structure, sucks the sand up, pumps it into the shore. You saw it explained in the video. I'll skip over this one. Um, why beach nourishment? Beach erosion is expected to become increasingly more detrimental in the coming years. You know it, I know it, we all know it. While the construction of hard structures like seawalls and reefs might last longer, soft engineering projects like beach nourishment and dune restoration are generally more sustainable and less intrusive, and it needs to be repeated every seven to 10 years. So what are the benefits in terms of public access? That has been a huge topic, right? How many times have people been coming to the council screaming about public access and why especially at, at down in, in that area because we're losing the shoreline the people's homes are right up against it there's no more beach left and so that 10 feet above of the seaweed is sometimes in these people's back decks and there's arguments and there's people screaming and yelling at each other and there's lawsuits well what do you do to solve the problem give them more of what everybody wants sand you add 150 feet of sand, the homeowners are going to have to realize that that's public property because it's paid for by public funding. And I don't think, and I'm not going to speak for the homeowners on Atlantic Avenue, but I think faced with losing their homes into the ocean for doing nothing or getting 150 feet of sand to protect their structures, I think maybe they won't, you know, scream and yell about who's walking across the beach anymore because it's going to be public that part of it, that 150 feet or whatever it is that the town adds. So you give them more of what they want. What the people want is to be able to go on the beach and actually have a place to walk. You can't walk from one end of Musquamic to the other these days because you walk in front of the wind jam or the pleasant view, you, there's nothing there. So, you know, bury everybody in sand, it'll work. Um, so this is the, the area I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a rinky dink portion. I'm talking about three miles from the Weekapog Bridge all the way past the last building on Atlantic Avenue. And hey, if Watch Hill wants to hook up and join the project, we could figure out how to continue it as well down, down, down the way. So here's the cost. This is, this is to put it in perspective. You like my little graphic there. It's eight to $10 million per mile. So we have three miles to do. 24 to 30 million for the project each decade. The Army Corps pays two thirds if they approve the project, which leaves a balance of eight to $10 million per decade. The state owns half a mile of the three miles, so they would be on the hook for four to five million dollars. The town would need to raise three to five million dollars per decade for this project, which is three to five hundred thousand dollars per year that you would have to set aside. You could take it from the meal tax. You could ask the fire district to, you know, contribute and add a tax. Or there's a ton of ways to do it. You could take the state beach money, which is like two hundred and fifty thousand a year that you get, and just put that in a bank account. And, and put some of the hotel tax in there. But regardless, it's, I'm, I'm not gonna say that three to 500,000 isn't a lot, but I mean, when, when the field was short 500,000, it's like, hey, yeah, all right, we'll take care of that. And when you have a surplus in the millions, to protect $9 million a year in property taxes, it seems a wise investment to put aside three to $500,000 a year to protect hundreds of your constituents' houses and businesses. So this is what Musquamica could look like if we were able to do this project. So I'll wrap it up. Perspective in spending, $100 million annual town budget, $50 million we just are spending for the elementary schools, $13 million was the police station. We spent $3.5 million to fix School Street. $3.5 million to fix one street in the town of Westerly. And I'm coming to you saying we need $3 million every 10 years to fix a three-mile stretch with 218 homes and 50 businesses and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in revenue and 9 million in property taxes. So, and we spent $3.5 million for the public works facility a few years back. So when put into perspective of the town's budget and town spending, it's pennies on the dollar to, do, to, to just put money aside so that we have a match. Because if we don't have, you know, 3 million towards the $30 million project, it doesn't get off the ground. So no action 
means nine million in property taxes from Esquamac gets lost and everyone in every other part of town, your taxes will go up if there's no more beach money. You're gonna forsake $90 million a year uh, per decade in property taxes or spend three to $5 million per decade to save $90 million in income or spend hundreds of millions of dollars to remove all the structures. So let's think about that. You can't just let that fall into the ocean. Those, those places have to be bought out, eminent domain, fair market value. You got to take up the street. You got the water going down the street. You got the electric. Imagine removing three miles of, of infrastructure at that beach and the cost involved in that. So you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to buy out 218 houses and 50 businesses or spend three to five million per decade and prolong the life of your beach. And yeah, it's got to be done every decade because mother nature keeps eroding beaches. So in conclusion, inaction is going to cost more than taking action. The long term benefits include greater public access, protection of your assets, the town's assets that you just purchased this winter, your infrastructure, town and state property, homes and jobs. The problem is the clock is ticking. There's just not a lot of time left. And what this is going to take is this isn't Caswell's proposal. This isn't the MBA's proposal. This needs to be the town of Westerly's problem. And you guys need to take the leadership and it can't get sent to another study committee. We need action because some of my business owners down there and some of the homeowners have said, we don't have five years left. And, and, and that's the truth. We are at that tipping point where there's no more time. So, um, I know in, uh, in in Quentin Jaws, if you ever liked the movie Jaws, he said you either need to pay up or be on welfare all winter. But it's true. You, you either got to put something down, or you're going to be we're going to be out of business. And let me tell you, if Musquamacut Beach disappears in, and it becomes just a sand spit, Westerly loses its character. And I can't explain it any other way. So. That's my presentation. I, I, I need, to, I need to, to know that this town council at least would make a decision saying, yeah, we can go forward with doing something like this, or we're, we would rather just see everybody kind of leave and we can try to get some federal money to buy out some places and, and, and have a, a dignified exit from that strip. But some kind of an answer, you know, yes or you know, no is is needed. The state rep and the senator got to be on board. The governor's office, DEM, CRMC, the fire district, the MBA, the homeowners, everyone's got to be on board or nothing's going to happen. So that's my presentation. I leave it to you. I, I, I can ask, I can answer questions if you have any, um, but I'm hoping you'll take some action. Thank you, Council, for the presentation. And it was enlightening. I appreciate, I appreciate that. Did you uh, price out a potential seawall out there? No, because nobody wants the CRMC and, and all the, the agencies that you go to, and it's been tried, it was tried 30 years ago, they don't want those kind of structures. Um, they don't want seawalls. Uh, they don't want you to put rocks around things anymore. They just, they, as much as I think it could help, although it was, it was brought up that I was going to propose a seawall, and I think they started going off on one of those social media sites that Caswell wants to kill the waves or something. I'm like, oh, whatever. Um, but, you know, it's something that could be looked at, but it, the problem is time. And the most, um, tried way of doing this is these 400 projects that have been done with beach nourishment and it's the most eco ecologically sound way to do it but again i'm not an expert right right because I, I just see the sea walls you know outside of stonington and uh, up at point judith and they, they just work really nice and it's kind of almost like a permanent solution and i'm sure they're not going to be there forever but you might get 50 or 100 years out of them. Um, so I was just curious as that is a potential option. I'm sure everything's an option. Thank you. I have a couple of quick questions, please. First, thank you for your presentation. It was very informative and very well done. Um, the first question I want to ask is CRMC. 
and the fact that they've given you a cease and desist right now, is it still in effect that you can't put the sand back? And, and how, are you, how are we gonna work with that situation? Yeah, I'm not a fan of CRMC's methods uh, sometimes, um, but their job is to, is to protect uh, our coastline. I went to that meeting that Victoria Gu had last week, and what I saw at, at the table was, you know, there's a guy that works for the president from FEMA, and there was Rima, and there was all these people, and they're like, we've got all this money to hand out, and we got SBA loans, and I'm going, and they're like, we're here to help survivors. And I'm like, man, you guys are like square peg round hole. There's no survivors from a winter storm in Musquamica Beach, and everyone's a second homeowner, so there's no money coming. And you can ask the town manager, but I don't think there's any money coming from, from all that the president's declared disaster and all this stuff. And I think the governor thinks we're getting money, but we, we aren't because what the disaster that they declared won't help us. So I said to them, I'm like, if you have a line to the president, instead of spending millions of dollars on whatever it is you're doing and having like 50 staff to send on Rhode Island, just give us 25 million bucks, we'll take care of it, you know? And then Matuda could do the same thing. Um, but the bottom line is CRMC to, to kind of get back to what you were saying. They don't have a problem, and the, the director of CRMC was sitting there, they don't have a problem with beach nourishment. He, the guy was fine with it. He said, it's just about the money. And so there's no opposition to it. As far as uh, cease and desist, yeah, I mean, I think it's ridiculous. I think that the what happened after Superstorm Sandy was the state and the agencies got together and they issued permits to people along uh, Musquamica Beach and people were able to get the sand put back on the beach. They're not doing it like that. And they're saying to us in public meetings, oh, this is a quick, quick process. Well, I saw an email from one of the people who got a cease and desist. He put in his application in early April and he just got an email back. So it's going to take another eight to 10 weeks. I mean, ridiculous. I mean, this is for like someone who has a hotel on the beach. So he can't put that sand back on the beach. He has to wait until what, July to put it? It doesn't make any sense. So a lot of these agencies, while they certainly mean well, and I'm not here to trash anyone, I, I, I would say that all those people on all those panels, none of them have a house in Musquamacate. None of them have a business in Musquamacate. None of them live there. And it's not a top priority. So like I said, I am not an agent. I'm not here on behalf of anything except I don't want to see the beach I've worked at for 30 years disappear. Did FEMA say that they would actually look, you know, try to give money? Like there was an application that had to be filled out so so you could get some money for the beach? No, everybody just looks in other directions when I ask for money. No, nobody will cough anything up. What has to happen is the town of Westerly would need to say, hey, Army Corps, is this a feasible project? And they looked at it once before and they, they came up with this thing called the Pawkatuck River Study, which makes no sense because I thought it was a study of the Pawkatuck River, but it wasn't. It was a study of the coastline from Watch Hill to Galilee, um, but they named it Pawkatuck River Study. And they said that there wasn't enough, it wasn't cost effective to do a project similar to this. Now, this was also several years ago before like Montauk Point got done. And they also only took into account the actual uh, price of the structures if they were to be replaced on the beach side only of Atlantic Avenue, which makes no sense because it's not just the structures, it's the jobs, it's the it's the taxes, it's the economy, it's, it's our way of life. So I would say the first order of business is to go back to Army Corps and say, let's take another look at this. Because if they agreed to pay two thirds and the state would come up with another portion and the town only has to come up with the three million, I think it's an easier sell. And and my last question regarding dredging, would we need to look into that every year, every other year? Every, we don't do that now, do we? We've only done one dredge project since 1960. Okay. And it took 10 years to get it permitted. Um, it's it's definitely ter terribly slow, but I know Senator Reed's office could be a huge help in this. I, I know that we should take more sand out of the Winnipeg pond and maybe part of it could come out of there. But as far as doing something that's quicker um, is to have that offshore dredge. Um, I, I'd like to get some of the sediment out of the pond too. We were able to get a very little amount, but it can come from both ends. I don't care where it comes from. It's just got to start. <laughs> well, you have to be careful with the pond with the farms in there. So. Yeah, but they still all say that they should be dredged more. You Thank know. you very much. Yeah. I think we did dredge Winnipeg Pond. Yeah, it cost us $4 million. 
did it a couple of times. I think one time it was 52,000 tons. One time it was 75,000 tons. We put it on the state beach. I think it washed away in a week. Um, I'll say this, Caswell, you're, you're probably Mesquamacate's favorite adopted son. I was born into Mesquamacate. And I'm gonna tell you my, my feelings on this. I think you save the beach. It's a barrier beach. You save the beach by retreating eventually. I, I, I can't agree with some of the numbers here. When I hear $10 million, that's a whole village in Mesquamacat. I think you're talking Atlantic Avenue to me is from, uh, I guess it's Scholar's House all the way on one end to what I always call the Gentiles Market on the other end. And that's about three and a half million. And by the time it disappears, that might be around an error. And you tell us that we're going to be Hopkinton without Mesquamacat Beach. We'll never be Hopkinton because we have Watch Hill taxes. And Watch Hill has high property values, and they pay a lot of taxes, and they don't send kids to school. So we're, we're never, ever going to be Hopkinton, whether, whether we have structures up on Atlantic Avenue or not. Uh, and, and how many times, and this is the part that really scares me as someone who loves the beach, how many times is the state and the Army Corps of Engineers going to watch all the sand wash away, millions and millions of dollars wash away before they say, you know what? Maybe we do need a breakwater or to sink a ship or to do something that changes our waves. And then, uh, and then we got Ocean Beach. And then I might as well stay home and stay in the swimming pool with my nephew's pee from a few days ago. The reason, the reason I love Mesquamica Beach is because it is such an open beach. And, and uh, if we have to end up retreating, then that's what we have to do. But all this is, uh, I don't think economically it works. And I, I don't think that you change the, the nature of a barrier beach either. So I'm sorry, for me, it's gonna be a no. Well, again, I'm not just to, I mean, you know, you can certainly have a glass half empty approach, um, but I want you to, you know, bear in mind that if 218 houses on Elm Street were in jeopardy, you'd jump to action tomorrow. I'm not wrong. If it was in any other part of town, you would all jump to action immediately but it's because it's people that own second homes and we don't want to help millionaires. And that's what I hear. I'm not saying you, you guys as a council, but it's like, screw them, who cares? And I get it. They have a house on the beach. It's worth $2 million. They're not going to go in the poor house if their house goes in the ocean. I get it, but we're, we're going to lose all their money. That's the problem. You know, I mean, do we care if Taylor Swift lives here? Probably not, but she pays a good amount of taxes. And so, you know, I, I don't understand. I've never quite understood the sort of animosity towards summer or part-time residents who come here, spend more taxes than the rest of us who live in the rest of Westerly, don't put kids in the school, don't require any services, and then we ask uh, for $300,000 a year to be set aside so that they can keep paying their taxes, and it's like, no, I want you to fall into the ocean. So I, I, you know, I have to just disagree with you on that, and I mean respectfully, and we, we can disagree, and that's fine. I'm just saying that eventually, and you know, if you look at Superstorm Sandy, it's the whole Musquamica Fire District that was affected. It went all the way up to the to the hey, Breezeway Kevin, Resort. Kevin's got a question. Sure. I'll say thank you for the presentation. I, we have, you know, sea level rise, affordable housing. You know, I think those are like two of the top three or four problems that we have chat where I will say challenges that we have right now in this town. Oh, I think and, problems the word for it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is the first real substantive discussion that we've had in our term about it. So thank you for, for bringing it to us. Um, I, I think I will agree with, with one thing that Councilor Petra said that is, it is inevitable that we are going to have to retreat from the beach. The, the process that we have to go through is to figure out where the diminishing returns lie in the strategy of mitigation. And I, uh, you know, you lay, you lay out a really compelling economic case for, uh, for beach restoration. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, we're gonna have to understand, I would definitely be for pursuing the Corps of Engineers and understanding if they will, if it's, if it's feasible, if they will pay for their two thirds, if the state of Rhode Island would pay for Misquamica, you know, if we determine all of these things and then we look at our, uh, you know, what we potentially lose in tax revenues and we make it balance out, you know, we have to do that cost benefit analysis. And then the next time around we do that cost benefit analysis is gonna be very different because the seas are gonna be, you know, three feet higher. And, you know, we know that what we get the first time if we go down that route, it's not what we get the second time. 
Um, so I'm definitely in favor of starting this process. I do have a couple questions about, because I know you, I remember after one of the storms, Sue, in one of your videos, you had talked about beach scraping. Uh, and I just want to hear like why you kind of moved off of that and onto, and onto uh, restoration. And as well, like how dune, dune restoration could also factor into some of this. Sure. I'll start with the dune restoration because that's the easiest one. Wherever there's a great dune, like at the state beach, and you can sacrifice the first third of the dune to the weather, it works. And it works at the at the town beaches. And the problem we have is that because we have waited so long to take any kind of action, you can't build the dune in front of the Pleasant View. There's no, it's water. You can't build the dune in front of some of these houses. So yeah, if we could put another 150, 200 feet of beach up that strip, it would be I, and, and we should make it mandatory that it would be dunes all the way along that entire thing. I mean, it might affect somebody's view, but so what? Yes, dunes are totally important. Beach scraping, I don't want to go down the road because so many people are opposed to it and because CRMC is opposed to it. And I don't, at this point, beach scraping is not going to save the beach. What beach scraping used to do, as far as from my point of view or what the people used to do in Musquamacate, is they would push the sand up to uh, in the winter time to uh, stop the you know to protect the the structures and then in the springtime they'd push it back down. Well, Mother Nature scraped the beach for us three times this this winter. They it, Mother Nature scraped the sand and but just threw in the in the in the street and then we put the sand back on the beach. So I it, it's not it's not a ditch I want to die in. Um, and if we put 150 or 200 feet of sand on the beach, there's no need to even talk about beach scraping. I was trying to find a way that is the most environmentally friendly way to do this. And the 400 projects that have been done have proven now, do some of them go awry? I'm sure. Uh, is, are there cases where they do like a little tiny stretch of beach, $500,000 worth, and then it's the next storm takes it away? Yeah. And that's why I'm saying to you, if it's not done in a whole approach, a holistic approach, a, a you know, a, from one end to the other, it's not going to work. It can't just be done piecemeal. You can't say, well, I can't do that because that's in front of a house, or I can't do that because that's in front of a business. You got to just bite the bullet and say, we're doing the whole thing. But as far as the public's concerned, now there's access because the minute you put tax dollars towards sand, it ain't private no more. Thank you. Thank you, Caswell. Um, this is heartbreaking because we really are here now. It's here much, much faster than we all thought it would come. It's here. And we're looking at Atlantic Avenue disappearing. I get it. I agree with Councillor LaPetra. How long can we stave off Mother Nature? She's going to win. She will ultimately win. But I don't think anybody in this town is ready to go down without a fight. Not yet. Not me. Um, we can, if we, if we went with this, right, we went with beach nourishment, we're going to get 10 years. I think that in tandem, studying whether we're going to go that route or not, we need to have in tandem with public participation, your slide showed CRMC, state legislators, residents, this, that, the other, the residents, the fire districts have to know this is going to be public. We also have to think 20 years ahead. When do we prohibit rebuilding? When do we retreat? When do we start retreat? I don't think it's feasible every 10 years to try to maintain, as sad as it is, our beaches. And that goes to you know, you talk about property tax, you talk about business revenue, you talk about livelihoods. Um, the town needs to turn its focus away from tourism a little bit. We are too heavily dependent on that. And I just think that we have to do all of this at once or in eight or nine years, we're going to be oh my gosh, all these residents, all these businesses, and we'll have done nothing 
to prepare the town for what will be the eventual loss. So, you know, I'd be willing to make a referral tonight to get this going in conjunction with planning, zoning, EDC, CRMC, everybody to come up with a plan, a long range and a short term plan. You know, maybe we'll have 150 feet next July. It would be wonderful. And thank you for, we all feel the same. You know, this is our town. That's our beach. It hurts. Mm. And is it worth it to me financially for the town to spend the money? Yeah. It's what we are, but not forever, you know? So please, you know, work, work with us, work with the residents and the businesses. And, you know, they need to know that there's eventually going to have to be some sacrifice, a lot, to be able to keep up what we have. And, and that's why, I, you know, just to respond to that, uh, that's why I came to you first, because, you know, I know how the town runs. You know, if, if you guys say, no, don't pursue this, well, I, you know, what am I going to do? Or what are we going to do? So it's got to sort of start from the council. It's not this, I, I just, I, I want to throw this out there and I'm going to go to the fire district board and I'm, um, you know, I'll, I'll chop this around a, a little bit, but I mean, I'm just kind of at this point, volunteering to do this but i mean i obviously i have a stake i, I don't want to get gone but yeah it's got to it's got to come from you guys and you can research the barrier reefs and all that stuff too at the you know same time um it doesn't just have to be casual's idea you know i'm giving this to you you do with it as you tell me to do with it <laughs> or you do it and tell me to go sit down and you take it which would be fine too <laughs> uh Caswell, your enthusiasm is in fact just uh I, I I if Dylan's a half full guy, I'm almost empty. But uh it might be because of my background. But anyway, uh you know, I came from Sarasota a few years ago and they do it quite often. Uh, but they don't do the whole beach, they do Sar uh Siesta Key and Longbow Key, but they just do sections, but they are they do it, but they have a you know, it's almost a billion dollars a year in business they get there. That's the thing. And in Montauk Point, yes, they did. And we'll see how successful they are. I think they are so far, but they got a ton of money too. That's that money is an issue. The other problem, well, and Taylor Swift, she's going to be the last person. She's going to be the last person fighting Mother Nature because she's the highest in town. So she will be the last defense against Mother Nature. But, you know, some of this stuff about the housing on the beach that bothers me as well is you go down there now and people are building beaches, I mean, houses right on the beach. And so that's kind of offensive when, I don't know, it was two years ago, NOAA finished their mapping of Rhode Island. I don't know if you... You gotta get some new chairs if budget, budgets are tight. <laughs> so, so NOAA did their mapping of Rhode Island. They had a uh, Zoom meeting and I attended that Zoom meeting. And I'm not sure, I'm trying to find it online because you can go online and look at the map. I was I was astounded astounded because uh, I think they said in 2040 or 2050 the latest high tide will be Atlantic Avenue that was their model two years ago and most people are saying that Noah's models are already out of date because it's going that rapidly so that's why I'm pessimistic because even the the if you take Noah's best numbers that that the high tide will be Atlantic Avenue in 2050 or something like that it's probably going to be quicker it's it's just going to be quick. I, I wish you the best. I mean, you can, you don't have to listen to this council. It'll be gone in five or six months and you can get on the council and do whatever you want. But that, that's the other problem I have. And it is a barrier beach. And you know, the beauty of Napa tree point is that it has no houses. It moves, it moves like a tail. And so the beach always remains, but nothing can be on the beach. But, uh, so that's why I'm pessimistic and the money, even not, not even people sometimes. What's that? A <laughs> nap tree point. Yeah. I'm joking. Well, I missed the joke. But anyway, so uh, that's why I'm pessimistic. And the other thing is about the numbers. One is, you know, yes, those are numbers today. They're not going to be numbers in five years when the town or 10 years, whenever it gets around to this. 
and then the money is drying up, as you know, because the difference in attitude uh, from CRMC, from Superstorm Sandy to this winter is night and day. And I think I've talked to you about that. You know, they just, before it used to be just go ahead, fix it. We'll give you the permits later. Now they're saying, don't fix it. And uh, maybe we'll give you a permit. And I think that's telling. It's not just CRMC, C, you can say, well, I don't agree with them. But they're they're getting their orders above them. I mean, it's so. Listen, I don't want to talk you out of it. You go for it. If anybody could do it, you can. It just there's a lot of problems and a lot of uh, you got. And I don't know if you could shorten it so it's only part of the beach. I know you say the whole beach needs to be replenished. Uh, is there no way you can do just part of the beach? I mean, as a there has to be all or nothing. I think it fails if you just try to do segments. It, it'll happen, what happened with the state beach, it'll be cool for a year or two, and then it's just gonna wash. You, you've got to do a longer stretch so that you, it, it doesn't erode. You can't have, you know, if, if the profile, if, if, if the sand goes out 80 feet from the dune, and then all of a sudden it juts out to 150, and then goes back to 80, that, that spit that's out there, that's gonna get washed yeah, out. So that's for, uh, Mr. Overton's jetties and things come in. But anyway, yeah. I got your point. That's all I got to say. I wish you the best. I really do. Well, yeah, I hope everybody does have an opportunity. I just want to say one thing. Let's not get carried away and call this project or this idea, save the beach. The beach will always survive. The beach will endure. The beach will flourish. This project we could call it save, save the structure of the Atlantic Avenue. We could call it save the wind jammer, but it's not save the beach. The beach will always be here, and the, the, the citizens of Wesley will always will always be able to get to the beach. It's a barrier beach, and it's not going anywhere. If we if we have a tactical retreat, it might even be better than it is today. Uh, just for point of I, I I never called this save the beach. I called it a beach nourishment proposal. It's not me against you. It's not us against them. It's a proposal. You can accept it. You can tweak it. You can run with it, or you can tell me to go screw. And I'll accept anything. <laughs> Caswell can dish it, but he can also take it, right? Um, a couple of comments that, yeah, Mary and I also attended that meeting last week with Senator Gu and, and all these all these agencies. And it was interesting, and, and CRMC didn't really oppose it, but they did come down to the dollar figure, especially when you take into account the rest of the coastline in the Rhode Island. So there's a lot of competition. Um, all in all, I mean, the price tag, yeah, I mean, if, if will the car, it would be interesting to see if the core would even be entertaining the, the discussion. Um, as you know, when we, Winnipeg was dredged, uh, there's a lot of restrictions on where you could dredge. You can't, can't touch this area. You can take it from here and not from right. here. So there's all that with the Winnipeg. So I have a, a question. Maybe you can just think it over and maybe you've already addressed it. But with the sea level rise, um, have you also looked at the Reachway and Winnipeg Pond, how much that's going to rise? Because that's all ocean water that comes in there, right? So trying to balance those two things out. Yeah. And you know, there's one section of Atlantic Arrow that, that floods very frequently. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not offering a 50 year solution. I'm not offering a 30 year solution. I'm offering a solution that could be a decade and then it could be reassessed, hopefully by somebody besides <laughs> me, a decade down the road. And part of it is building up the profile of the beach so that it is higher than the current sea level. And that's part of what some of those other projects have done so that in the, in the shorter term, meaning in, in, a, in the next decade, every rainstorm doesn't turn into a flooding disaster and you're spending a hundred thousand dollars a year to clean it up yeah and i guess my point was that yes if you raise up the, you could raise the dunes up 100 feet but if we don't take care of that back channel mm -hmm. are people going to be able to access the beach anyway so there, there's a lot involved with that so there is it'd be interesting to see how far the crow would be willing to go um i guess the feds could just print more money but then our our, our Grands and grands and grands will be paying for it forever, but yeah. Well, I, I would say that the just in, in my final comment would be, it would take you guys sending this to Army Corps to see if they would do it, and that's probably what I'm asking for tonight is for you to at least have that discussion and say, you know, because if they come in and, and say absolutely not, and of course the, the first thing they're going to just want to let you all know, 
the first thing that CRMC, DEM, Army Corps, FEMA, REMA, any of those agencies are going to say is, no, it can't be done. And I don't usually accept that as an answer because it can be done and because it's been done in 400 other places. And there's nothing different about Musquamacate from Montauk or from any of these other places in terms of the profile of the beach, things like that. So, you know, once you get past their initial squawking and say, no, seriously, we want you to re-examine this and to look at this. And, and I'd say that would be a great place where the council could, you know. I think, yeah, and I agree that with, with time, money, technology and the skill, anything can be done. Um, I think at this point with the presentation, I, I think we've got the information. And I think if the council under a general referral wants to bring this back for further discussion and a potential recommendation or, or seeking something from the Army Corps, then, then we could do it at that time. But I think probably a general referral would probably be a good place um, for the council to bring this back. I'm here to help. Hear Just let Thank me you. know. You, you know my number. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Are you familiar with uh, Section 14 of the, I think it's the Army Corps of Engineers, yeah, 1946 Flood Control Act, where you know, the Army Corps of Engineers will, will spend money to protect places. You're not, you haven't checked with them at all. No. All right. That's it. That would that'd be above my pay grade. That'd be something that needs to Well, that, guys that's to... Section 14 of the 1946 Flood Control Act. Just every. Thank you, Caswell. Thank you. 